evening. It's Mark from Apprentice One to One. I'm just about to record with tonight's guest, and that is Stuart Cato. I'm going to let him introduce himself on the podcast, but I thought I would just mention that Stuart is from a military background. Um, he trained in the armed forces as an electrician, and he now earns and operates his own business called Cato Electrical Services. And he, he's done that for a number of years. And we've got him on tonight to speak about his background in the military, some of the things he, he was involved with, um, his route as a, a, to learn to be an electrician, some of his experiences then building his own business and opinions on the apprenticeship system. We're going to talk about uh, the NVQ, the short courses, we're going to talk about tools, uh, we're going to have a, a chat on the state of the industry and we'll probably cover software and a few other bits and pieces as well. Um, Stuart's on, on Instagram and uh, LinkedIn and I'll pop links to his profiles in the description of this video. Please go and check him out. Uh, he, he's a guy who is installing um, some, some great stuff so he does work in a lot of plant rooms uh, with smart home installations as well. Uh, really, really interesting installations and um, he utilises software packages, so Electrical OM, to do um, design install and certification and I'm going to get him to have a, a chat about that in the video if I remember as well. So please enjoy, please like and subscribe to the channel, it makes a great difference to other people perhaps coming across it and the whole purpose of this is to try and share opinion and ideas around the apprenticeship system and uh, if more people are aware of it, more people can become involved and that's all a good thing from my point of view. Uh, there's a lot of people waiting to come onto the podcast, so we have quite a few ready to record with. I've got more this week, and if you do want to come on and have a chat yourself, please reach out and get in touch. Everybody is welcome. I, I will make the time to, to do these recordings. And anyway, let's cut straight to it with Stuart. Enjoy. Uh, welcome to the Apprentice One to One podcast. I'm your host, Mark Allison. And before we dive into chat with our guest this evening, who if you're watching, you'll be able to see on screen already. I uh, just wanted to mention we do have a, a number of roles available at the moment. So if you go over to the Instagram page on the Apprentice One to One website, they are listed on there now. Uh, there's several employers of late since the turn of the new year popped up. So go and check them out if you're listening. Uh, roles all over the United Kingdom. So that's that's good to see. But tonight, we're going to chat with Stuart Cato. He's agreed to come on and have a discussion about his history in the trade and um, his his role today and all of the bits in between. And he does have a, a, an entry into this industry that's not a, a, a standard one. It's um, it's a bit different. Well, it is and it isn't. There's a lot of people who tread that same path, actually, in fairness. And um, getting Stuart's opinions and ideas is going to help a lot of people treading that route today. So... First and foremost, how are you, Stuart? Thanks for coming on. No problems, Mark. No problems. Oh, I'm good, thank you, mate. And yourself? Yes, yes, I'm doing very well. Trying to work off some of the Christmas excesses. I think everyone's in that boat <laughs> at the minute. But yeah, I think we've all overdone it to a point. So yes, um, not doing too bad. You are the owner of Cato Electrical Services. Am I getting that right? That's correct, yeah. 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 And um, when when did you start start that business, business up? Uh, well, to be honest, we went limited a couple of years ago, um, but we started, I started working for myself in uh, 2006, end of 2006, after I left the army. Yeah, um, that, that was that was uh, my next question, actually. So when you actually um, started your business, you had, you had left the army and you'd actually done an electrical apprenticeship while you were in there, hadn't you? So you hadn't just... Um, been an, been an engineer well not just but being an engineer in the army you had actually served an electrical apprenticeship in there haven't you uh to to an extent yeah it's the it's not really an apprenticeship we do uh we do a a, a long course um which is about i think it's 10 months off the top of my head the first part of it um yeah and that's that's how we do it so we don't do a, a conventional apprenticeship Okay, so it's it's more specific, I guess, for the kind of installs you're going to be encountering while you are in the military. It's not like you're going to be house bashing and such, I wouldn't have thought. Or, or was there elements of that as well through the course of your time? Uh, no, there was certainly elements of that because we were we were working to the regs. Um, obviously, we, we learn how to do it. Um, we, le we learn all those bits and pieces, but we do have specific military modules that we cover as well. 
Okay. Okay. And when, when you were doing that, I guess you had roles all over the world. Did you have stuff taking, taking place outside the country or was you primarily based in the UK? No, once I, uh, once I finished my training, I would say I, I probably spent half of my time away. Um, uh, Kenya, Cyprus, Iraq, wow. Afghanistan. Wow. Um, yeah. So yeah, I guess so you've, we, see, you've, you've seen some, um, installations that are a bit different to what some of us regular sparks coming through a normal apprenticeship <laughs> might might see um you know i can't even imagine what some of that must be like so was, was that building up barracks and things um remote work locations or what, it, what was, it was, what was some of that like host of, yeah it was a whole host of things sort of in the in the more operational zones like uh, iraq and afghanistan it's it's setting up bases it's it's building um uh, well, in Iraq, we built a effectively an airport. Wow. Um, but then in in places like Cyprus, we were doing maintenance. So yeah. back then, there was the uh, there used to be the buffer zone where yeah. um, the two halves were split, and we used to patrol and maintain the area in between them. Fantastic, and that's that's one of the important aspects I want to get out through Apprentice One to One. I mean, you, you've been in the military there, getting that experience, and there is such a wide vocational range across the electrical industry. There's people in school who think it's just a case of you get a local contractor and go off and start learning from them, but there's so many different areas of this industry you can go into, from military routes all the way up to working now in in smart tech and things like that. Um, even into wholesaling, there is such a wide variety of, of roles available. And that's why I love the electrical industry as much as I do. And um, hearing your journey into it is, is quite relevant because there's a number of people coming through the military route now who don't have the, the training you have. Actually, they, they've been um, in different roles. Uh, one of the guys in particular I'm thinking was on a nuclear submarine. Um, and whilst he isn't a trained electrician, he wants to now become one. So it's kind of trying to find the right advice to give those kind of people of some of the courses that might be relevant to them. Um, is there any kind of input or advice you could give to that? I mean, did you have to take any specific courses when you left um, the military and came into civil life or was you already qualified to set up and start trading straight away? Uh, no, so we were we were fully, well, I was fully qualified when, when I left. Um, we did because all of our training facilities were uh, city and guilds registered. So we sat all the, all the relevant courses uh, and qualifications. So when I left, I was in a position to fully start um, from the word go, really. Um, it's quite tricky for, for other guys leaving, obviously, who haven't got the qualifications, because it really depends on, on the level of their experience and, and what they've done and, um, it's very, it's very hard to know what would be the best thing for them. Yeah, that's the issue I've got because a lot of them are asking me, and I, I genuinely don't know. So, um, people might not be aware, but when you when you leave the military, there is sort of financial support, isn't there, to take training courses to to resettle into wider society. Well, that's what some of these guys are telling me now, and um, they're looking at the best way of spending some of that money, whether it's on a short course or um, trying to pay for a, a longer apprenticeship and, and fund their reduced wages while they do so. Um, you know, obviously, a lot of these people have families. They're, they're not living at home with parents. They have um, costs to cover. Um, so I've been kind of directing people off to careers advice. And, and generally, they're coming back saying, well, these people don't know either. So it's really quite difficult. Um, did you get support? when you left the military with any kind of advice with that? Uh, there wasn't a lot of advice. Um, what we did have, we had the, the resettlement package, which was, uh, which is some financial input into training courses. What I did, I put that towards a, a TV and satellite installation course. So we could cover all sort of those sorts of works as well. Um, that's one side of the business that we've sort of, we've put on the back burners now. But that was a, a big part of the work when I first left. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to advice, not, not really, because there's so many avenues that people want to cover. And, and it's not just the electrical industry. People are going into every sort of industry out there. Yeah. So the advice they can get is, is quite minimal, really. 
yeah, it must be incredibly difficult, actually, in fairness, for, for that support to be given. And um, if, if there's funding made available, that, that's helpful for sure. So, yeah, I guess... I guess my my own advice to that would be it depends on your own circumstances. If you have that level of competence, there there is a a time and a place for the short courses. Um, that they're not um, really the accepted route if you don't have that competence or uh, prior experience. But they do have a place, and sometimes it can help out, especially people who come through um, a military route. So there is that option, and it is really, really difficult to get a, an adult apprenticeship anywhere. So it's quite, it's quite tough, and um, you know, it's it's hard for those people who are getting in touch. You know, I can think of probably twenty or so since I started this who have done. Uh, so you know, that that was my my own little advice on there. And again, I'm I'm not an expert on that, which is part of the difficulty. Uh, move moving on from that, um, you're now set up as an established um, business. You employ people, is is that right, Stuart? You've got a, a couple of employees. Yeah, I've, I've got somebody that works for me and uh, a couple of sort of part-time subcontractors that we bring in on uh, on some of the larger jobs. So, yeah, yeah we've, we've got a couple of people there. Yeah, good stuff. And um, we've chatted before about this on, on a couple of the other podcasts we did over on EGTE, but you kind of specialised into a couple of niche areas, is it fair to say, with um, uh, your energy efficiency and now smart homes with the looks of it as well? Yes, yeah. So we we decided that we wanted to sort of try and push uh, into all the the new emerging markets. So, sort of 2010, we jumped on the the PV bandwagon. So we've been doing that for 10 years. Uh, we we work very closely with a company that installs heat pumps. So we do all their controls and and connections. Then, yeah. Then we jumped on the EV bandwagon as well. So doing all the vehicle charging and now we are KNX and Control Four uh, registered installers. I've seen some of the, the pictures you've been popping up on Instagram. Actually, you, you're quite new over there, I think, and you know it looks quite interesting. Some of the, the things you're getting involved with. Um, I mean, for me, we don't touch any of the smart home things at all, so I'm a total novice with it. Um, and I think moving forward, it's something we're all going to have to get more more used to. And certainly for apprentices coming through now, do you think that's well worth them looking into? As a, as a learning resource because it's not something they cover in college to a great extent yeah I, I think it's it's definitely helpful to get a a knowledge a working knowledge of the systems even if you're not looking at installing or um working on them you know because you can you can always come across them on a eicr and, and the same with ev and and pv you know it's good yeah. to have a a basic knowledge of that because then when you do come to it you know what you're looking at the you know, the amount of times we get phoned up by local electricians who've done an EICR and they say, we've done this, but we're not going to test the PV system or even the circuit supplying the PV system because we don't know what we're doing. That is such and, good advice. That is really, really good advice. I mean, you do need to have a bit of knowledge about everything, even if you don't know exactly how to go and install a system like that yourself, to be aware of, you know, what's actually involved and what it should look like as a finished product is, is vital. Um so great, great point. You know, that that's for anybody really, not just an apprentice. Um, you know, that, that is sound advice. And as in terms of these these smart homes, do you find that it's a, a particular product range that you install? I mean, I, I've been following uh, the art of smart as well. I don't know if you know those guys. They're they're on yeah. social media quite a bit. And everyone seems to lean towards a specific is product. Are you are you tied down in that way or do you install all sorts of stuff from different manufacturers? see that's the thing when it comes to when it comes to smart homes they're they're all different kinds of things so so something like control four is a is a product mm. okay and they they make all their their bits and pieces now you can connect other bits to it like nest thermostats and uh security cameras and bits and pieces um so that's that's one thing but then with knx knx is actually a a control protocol so it's just a way that they talk to each other so there's there's i think there's about 400 different manufacturers of gainx products oh wow so they can all link together in, in the same system yes so they're all talking the same language and they all have to follow that that same uh communication protocol and yeah you can you can pull you should be able to pull any manufacturers and connect it to any other manufacturer 
Well, that is really interesting. And that actually yeah. leans into something one of the uh, college lecturers said to me last week that they think bits of this should be included in the apprenticeship now because we're talking of this, you know, it's it's fairly recent technology. I mean, smart homes have been around for, for quite a while, but it's becoming more mainstream, isn't it, every day right now? And if you look ahead maybe five, ten years, it's probably going to be everywhere as it becomes more cost-effective to go into new builds and such. So a lot of these apprentices are going to need to be aware of it, not just for EICRs, maybe that might be installing it day-to-day all the time. So it's maybe something that they want to be looking at to start including in with the trade tests and um, some of the, the apprenticeship training in colleges. Yeah, it's it's certainly something to look at. The the only thing I would say about that is there's so many different products and and the way that they connect together. So um, Control Four would work very differently to to Crestron or Lutron. Um, yeah. And there's there's so many different things that actually, if you were even just to cover a, a basic module, it would probably cover in a couple of weeks. Yeah, and that's the big problem. The same lecturer said they barely have enough time within the three, four years to actually teach the core principles correctly. So, you know, it, it is really difficult, like you say, to get any more information into youngsters in the, the window of time they've got. So that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, sp- speaking a bit about um, the actual NVQ through the apprenticeship, um, and I know we've discussed this in in, in private on, on chats and we actually mentioned it before we started recording, but what do you actually feel about the um, the NVQ as a qualification? I don't know if you've listened to any of the other podcasts. Some of the other guests, I've asked them the same question and they've all had differing opinions. Some of them think it's a, it's a good standard to have. Some of them think it's pony, as Sam would say. So I just wondered, <laughs> just wondered what you actually thought about it. What's your opinion on the NVQ? Um. It's a bit of a tricky one because obviously I think qualifications are good. um, But a lot of companies are using it as a be all and end all. You know, one of the the problems I had is when I did my qualifications, we were only city and guilds. They didn't put us forward for for the MVQ level three. So we did all the work um, just to to get the experience, but it wasn't put forward for the assessment. Mm. And likewise, they weren't a uh, NETS training facility. So we did an AM2 assessment, but we never got the qualification. Yeah. Now, what this means is is I can't get a CSCS card um, or ECS card because I don't have those qualifications. If and I, guess I got the, my qual- oh, sorry again. I was going to say, at, at the time, was you, was you aware that that was the case or did you genuinely think you were taking the right... Um, qualification to be able to do that or was it in something that wasn't even in your mind at the time to be honest it wasn't something that was in the mind because because actually what you know when we were doing the qualifications you don't know if you're going to go out into city streets or, or go stay in the military for um for your for your full time so it wasn't something we knew a we knew the implications of but b to be honest really cared you know yeah. as at the end of the day, as long as we got our money and could go out on a Friday night, it, it didn't yeah. really matter. Yeah, that's it. If you don't know at the time that it might be something that's important in the future, it's not something that is going to enter your head, is it? But you would have liked to have hoped that it would enable you to get the the NVQ and, and the gold card. You know, it's, it's, it's quite sad to hear that. And I think there's a number of other people in a similar situation to yourself, which does to a point make a mockery of it because you're you're a perfectly able competent electrician you're able to go off and um and be an eng tech with the iet and various other things like that um your, your competence isn't in any question at all and yet you can't get uh, an ecs gold card you know there's there's, there's mm. questions there to be answered around that yeah i'll, I'll just correct you there mark i'm not actually with the iet okay. i'm with the uh i'm with the institute of royal engineers so it's ah, the okay. it's the one for the, the the military side of life from the from the Royal okay. Engineers. Yeah, but um, similar thing, similar similar yeah, similar principle, isn't it? Exactly. It, we we still have to uh, meet the criteria of an engine tech set out by the Engineering Council. So um, yeah, yeah, that that part's identically the same. Um, I did speak to this to Mike Andrews a couple of years ago about this, and they were talking about you know there was there was talk of finding another route because it was you know at that point it was the am2 and the the mbq um that were the the sticking points and that was just because they were the guidance set out by the jrb 
Yeah, I've had similar things. And I think there is like a, a an adult learner's route you can do now or something where they'll, they'll come out and assess you and, and other bits and pieces like that. But I don't think it's very accessible and it doesn't apply to a lot of people in a lot of cases either from the, the research I did on that. I think that was about six months ago. And um, I'm sure Adrian won't mind, but Adrian Davies put a, a video up on YouTube recently. I don't know if you've caught that. And he said similar things about his training wasn't um, sold to him in the correct way, but he genuinely did think he was taking all of the right courses. And it wasn't until after the fact that he discovered he couldn't get his his gold card. So, I mean, this is, this is a big problem, I think, um, across the trade. And whilst we're holding this up as a benchmark now for, for youngsters, um, it, it's a good thing to have that definitely while it's um, correctly enforced and attained. But there's some of the people who are now kind of excluded from certain employers and certain routes through no fault of their own and, and certainly not due to a lack of skills. So for me, that that, that needs addressing and um, urgently. I don't know how you feel about that because, I mean, you've got your own business. So primarily, I guess it doesn't affect you day to day, but there'll be other people who are on the agency sector and other things like that, and they can't get the roles that the skills perhaps match just because of that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It, it's it's certainly a, a, a big thing, especially if you've been missold uh, your training. Um, a bit like a lot of the guys on the short courses who, who do the short courses and, and think they are yeah. fully qualified, experienced electricians at the end of it, um, where we sort of all know that the majority of people who do short courses aren't. Um, yeah. You know, there is, like we said earlier, there's uh, there's guys who come from the military who have the background and do the short courses and, and that's fine and they get the qualifications. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a tricky one, really. Yeah, it is. And there's no easy answer to a lot of these questions, in fairness. And, and I'm, asking this, I'm asking so many people these things because it's a way to try and gather opinion and thoughts throughout the trade. And I've asked the other people questions about short courses as well, and you've kind of touched on them there. Um, and I'm of the same opinion of you. They do have a place with a, with a small section of people, but I think a lot of these training organisations have run away with it and um, sell it by the bucket load to anyone and everyone just to make some money. And um, yeah. that, that, is, that is only hurting the trade for me. Um, you know, every, every course has a place. And to a point, we all do short courses. We all take the, the regulation courses. We do things like 2391 and, and, and such as that. And really, they're, they're aimed at practicing electricians, or they should be. But it's all packaged up into these these um, enticing new career routes, earning forty, fifty thousand pound a year after so many weeks training. And and the general public coming out of an IT background or working in a bank or wherever else, some of them don't know any better, and they seriously believe that that's what they're going to come out with. And it's only at that exit point they realise actually this isn't the case. And um, by then, it's too late. The money's gone. Yeah. You know, it's, it's really difficult and I feel sorry for a lot of people who have gone down that route. I don't um, have any grudge with them at all. It's it's the actual training organisations enabling it. I think they have a, a lot to be accountable for, for me. Um, but speaking a bit more about your, your business and um, apprentices, is it something you've perhaps considered in the future for, for your business? Would you like to be in a position to take apprentices into your company in the future? Yeah, that's the that's the sort of long goal plan. What we're looking at the moment is I've got to uh, expand. A, I've got to get another van, which means my uh, my colleague can then go off and, and do his bits and pieces. Which means then I can also I've then got the space to bring in an apprentice. Um, yeah, you know it's it's all well and good getting them to drive everywhere and, and bits and pieces, but I feel that they need to have have that security and they need to be part of the the process um and also you can uh, obviously coming from the forces you know we were always if, if, if you're on time you're late you know you, <laughs> you, yeah so so timing's a big thing for us as well um you know i, I remember when i i first left left the job uh, left the army and i'd be you know if i was going to be five minutes late to a job i was phoning the customer telling them you know, I'm really sorry. I'm going to be late. And the amount of customers yeah. who'd be like, what? Okay. Yeah. That doesn't matter. <laughs> and it's just cause from that mindset that, you know, you, you're always early in the army. Yeah. You've got to be there. Um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of one of the reasons as well that I'd like to get him on board in the van so he can, he can understand that principles and, 
Yeah, that's really that's really good. So I mean, you're wanting to get everything set in place so you've got a, a viable role for an apprentice to come in and um, you know have fun doing the job and also help your business. And and you're bang on again with you like in bin five minutes early. I'm I'm the same, but so many tradesmen, you're lucky if they actually turn up on the day they say they will. And um, you know, yeah. you start to you start to realise that I was the same back in 2006 when I started out myself. You know, you're always trying to make the right impression. You're turning up before you say you will and um, presented as best you can to to do a decent job. And once you actually get going, you realise that that's more of a rarity than it maybe should be. Um, but, you know, that's nice to hear that you're trying to set things in place for an apprentice position. And hopefully, you know, that, that will happen with um, your business and it can help you as well as helping them. Um, is, there, is there any sort of challenge that you can see in front of you on that i mean a big one that comes in from a lot of people is the actual funding that's available and um, how that's split between the colleges and the employers is that is that something that you'd maybe like to see addressed or is it not something that is really a consideration uh funding is always helpful um, yeah but it's it's finding that knowledge you know i i did look at apprentices a, a couple of years ago and trying to find that information trying to speak to colleges seemed quite um seemed quite painful it was a bit like pulling teeth really <laughs> and, that is so, so common yeah and just like some of the guys i'd speak to they just didn't seem motivated and um i, I had a bit of a a bad experience with apprentice as well um he actually contacted me saying look you know i, I, I work for a guy at the moment but i'm looking to do a looking to move I thought okay so I, I said look come come for a week's trial we can have a look see you know see what you like and so I was talking to him on the first day and we're in the van and uh and I said oh so you know who, who's the guy you work for and he, he told me his name I was like well okay I yeah I know him I went to school with him and uh he, he works in the same area as we do and I said oh so uh so does he, did you tell him you, you want to leave? It's like, no, I've just told him I'm on holiday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which they, yeah, which they just said, look, I, I can't be seen with you in my van if you've told him you're on holiday. You need to talk yeah. to him, tell him that you want to leave, explain to him, you know, why you want to leave instead of just abandoning him after a year and a half. You know, he's, he's put a lot of money into his training and, and bits and pieces. Um, and then that evening, I get an email saying, "Oh yeah, I've just uh, I've just told him I'm quitting, um, so I can come work for you tomorrow." Wow! <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, if 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 that's how you're going to play, if you're going to abandon him after 18 months, and yeah. you know, not even give him any warning or you know, any uh, have the common courtesy to talk to him about it, then I, I don't feel you'll want to be the you're the right person to work for me. Yeah, I mean, I can understand why that's a bad experience, Stuart. That sounds pretty bad. And, um, you know, there's there's a lot of apprentices who've, who've asked for good advice that they can be given to help them attract employers and actually keep hold of the jobs with them um, because a lot of them seem to be kind of in work for a few weeks and then and then laid off. And there's two sides to every story with that, as always. Um, and you raise a good point. I mean, there there is this thing about young people in general in today's society, and I think that's kind of historical throughout the generations. It's always the case that they get a bit of a kick in. Um, but yeah, I can I can understand that putting you off. It's not the best situation to find yourself in when you're genuinely trying to take someone on, and they're essentially moonlighting. Uh, you know, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It it, it didn't really make me uh make me want to try and push it for a little while. So. Uh... No, yeah. no. I mean, I mean, fortunately, I'm I'm aware of many, many people who are really des- they would love a job to come and work with someone like yourself, Stuart. And um, you know that there are there those people are out there. I can I can promise you that um, from what I've seen in this little adventure since March, April last year. Um, so they are there, and um, you know, hopefully, as things move on in the future, you, you maybe find that yourself uh, um, as your business builds. Uh, but just looking again at um, the funding aspect. I mean, you said about the colleges not really knowing where to direct you or to help with that. And that is another really, really good point because it's the same thing that a lot of people have been in touch with. Not so much about the the grants that are normally available, but about these um, coronavirus grants. So there's been some extra grants put in place by governments kind of encourage the employment of apprentices, especially ones who have been 
made redundant. But then actually finding the information for all of that is so difficult. It's buried within a link on a web page to a link on another web page to a link somewhere else. And then you've got to wait so many months till you find out if you're even um, applicable for these grants. It kind of suggests you will be, but doesn't make any promises. And, you know, it hasn't been made very easy when a lot of these employers are going to be small businesses who don't like admin and paperwork and faff. Um, You know, it's not been done in the best way. I don't think it's almost like it's set up in a way that people wouldn't ever bother actually taking the grants out is my own personal opinion. Although it was good to see they have extended them. They were all due to expire at the end of January. They've now been pushed on to the end of March. So if anyone is actually looking at that, um, it is on there. And there's a link on the Apprentice One-to-One website actually to to direct employers at. So hopefully, um, as we move forward and we all get back to the normal world we're used to, there will be some more funding put into the apprenticeship system to to try and help people um, like you and me, Stuart, um, be encouraged to train youngsters and um, make jobs for them because we would all, I mean, all of the people I speak to would love to have apprentices in the business, um, as many of them as they could. And um, really, we need a bit of support. Certainly some of the smaller businesses do anyway. That's that's my opinion. Um, I mean, how, how do you feel about that? Yeah, yeah. I, do you know what? I think any support possible to get guys into the industry, to get guys into guys and girls into apprentice roles um is is paramount and and like you say hiding it in website after website um is you know it it works for them because it means they're probably less people taking up the funding but it has a knock-on effect because at the end of the day you get more people into the industry you get more people earning a good wage you get more people paying tax you know and it it can only be be helpful for the whole industry to to try and make that funding and make that information more available. Yeah, you're dead right. I mean, it should be a lot easier than it is. Um, but but moving moving on from that, let's um, have a little little chat about some tools, something a bit different. This is another question that gets asked a lot, and again, I, I've asked all of the other guests this, um, and you are another standout person to ask. So if you had a couple of hundred quid. I started out at a hundred quid and then I realized it wasn't 1995 anymore. So we upped it to 200 <laughs> and you're, you're an apprentice setting out. Um, what would be your, your go-to tools? It doesn't have to be, to be brands. It can be if you want, but what would you be looking at getting just to get started and um, give yourself half a chance when you're turning up to site on the first day? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, uh, other than the basic uh, screwdrivers and um, uh, pliers and bits and pieces, um, I would say a, a good set of tools for working with armor. You know, that's it, it, we all do quite a lot of it, and you know, so so something like an armor slice. I know there, there's very much mixed opinions about armor slice, but personally, I feel they they make the job quicker and easier. Uh, you can get into the nice little tiny tiny corners. You know, when you've got an armor that's tight against the wall that you don't want to bend too much because because you 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 splay the armor, um, yeah. So something like an arm slice, but also one of the I think one of the best little tools I've got in my toolkit is a is a stubby adjustable spanner. Oh, nice. Okay, good show. Yeah. Good. So it's it's about it's probably four inches long, um, but it's great for um, for doing up glands, uh, stuffing glands, you know, armor glands, all those sorts of things. Because it's it's just enough to to get it to nip it up. But not, you know, we're not talking yes. red face tight. No. Um, but it's it's enough to to do it up. And again, for for things like stuffing glands, you can do them up nice and tight, but not risk damaging the gland. Yeah. Good point. I like that. I like that. Yeah. And and the the armor slice as well. Um, you know, people have that argument all the time that it should be a hacksaw or an armor slice. But I've used them and they work. They work a treat. I have no problem with them at all. There's a technique to using them and not burning the blades out. I made that mistake on the first two, just winding them in too tight to start with, and it, it can easily put people off once you've had a bit of bad experience with it. Once you get the technique, they work yep. great. And that is a cracking shout for apprentices because they'll spend a lot of time doing that, stripping armoured cables, especially when it's cold and it's outside. Uh, you know, that's a good one to get in your kit for sure. Uh, anything else that you might have in there? Yeah. Uh, in, in fact, a uh, dismantling knife. 
for again for armored so the you know the the hook knives with the little uh the nodule at the end that you can get under the pvc yeah. and just just run it down again yeah. that's a you know they're they're not too expensive you know i think probably 20 quid something like that um and and they make stripping armor a lot easier uh trying to think what else what else i've got in my tool bag at the moment <laughs> yeah, I mean that 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 is another another good shout. I mean, I use all these things um, day to day, and certainly it's one some of the tools that I was given right at the start. I wasn't lucky enough to have a, a knife that had a, a nice safe hook on the end, but I was given knives and hacksaws to start work on uh, steel wire armored cables. So you know that's that's a really good point. And a lot of the the other people have kind of gone with the traditional stuff like croppers and snips and screwdrivers. And um, the, this is this is a good good session of advice i think Stuart, you've raised some <laughs> new tools that people maybe haven't thought about as yet and um you know that's worth considering if you're an apprentice have a look at the i think it's ck who make the armor slice off the top of my head i think it's a ck product yeah and again you can get the the hook blade knives from ck and nipex and um all of the other manufacturers make them just have a have a trip onto amazon or the electrical wholesalers of your choice and, and stick it in the search bar and, and it'll pop up so good, good shout. And again, the another product actually. I don't know if you've seen these. I think it's called the Brocket, which is something that would go on your stubby adjustable um, wrench quite nicely. And that's for tightening up glands inside trunking. So your steel wire armor glands. I don't know if you've seen that. Okay. You know, normally no, you use a, a, a bush wrench or something to to nip them up with. This is a specific product that's been made to go over the the gland inside the trunking that you can get a little adjustable um, ratchet on and, and nip nip up the the glands. And again, use a use a small one because if you go mad on some of the glands we get given these days, they'll shear apart without any force at all. They're nothing like they used to be. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, if you to be honest, so the, we, we on, tend carry to on, use Stuart. the. Uh, I was going to say we tend to use the peanuts for for things like yeah. trunking which means yeah. you only need to tighten it from the outside. Yes, yes, they are yeah. brilliant. They're a little bit yeah. more expensive, aren't they? But it's worth the money if you're doing a lot of them. And I guess you will use a lot of these things because you're doing solar um, installs most of the time and um, your EV chargers and um, your biomass heaters or whatever else it is that you're installing, your air source <laughs> heat pumps and underground pumps. Yep. So I guess there's a lot of glanding involved in most of the work you do. Yeah, yeah, we, you know, even in sort of a lot of the the domestic properties you still end up with you know metal trunking and, and bits and pieces in the plant room because a lot of these jobs warrant having a big plant room yeah um so yeah i mean i've seen some of the installs you've put up on on linkedin and um, i'm hoping there's going to be some more jumping up onto instagram as you move that account um along and uh, some of the plant rooms that you've you've shared are, are incredible i mean i'd love to be working on stuff like that you know it's um it's it's a dream for someone who likes engineering even stuff that's nothing to do with the electricals so the pipe work and things you know it's all it's all nice to see um do you get involved with any of that or are you just the electrical side of it no we're, we're just the electrical side but we do have um we do tend to have some input with regards to uh where they're putting bits and pieces we tend to always try and liaise with the installers beforehand so that you know, so that we've got space to run our trunking around the top and, and bits and pieces like that. And because actually, because we work with the the company that installed the heat pumps, um, we do have that that relationship, which is uh, which is quite nice to do, actually. Quite a nice place to be. Yeah, I mean, that's good. I mean, I'm all for the electricians been in charge of the overall design because we're generally the ones who know what we're doing. So that's uh, that's <laughs> that's good good to hear. And actually, touching on that, yeah, you use um, design software as well, I think, don't you? You produce a lot of the drawings and um, customer packs for your, your installations. That's something that a lot of people don't, don't do, in my experience. Um, and I've seen you again sharing stuff around that. Um, is that a an interesting aspect that apprentices could look at is it electrical om i think it's called i might be getting that yeah wrong. electrical om yeah um it's yeah it's it's a phenomenal piece of software we sort of stumbled across it and um we we took up the basic package which in the scheme of things it isn't actually cheap but for a for a business it's certainly worth it um you know we initially took it took it down the the route of just doing the cable calcs and bits and pieces but then you can 
you can push that further forward and so you can do all the use schematics uh, and bits and pieces like that and then you can add on a uh, a design package so you can import your your AutoCAD or DWG drawings and put all the put all your sockets and switches and, and bits and pieces on there and because you can scale it up you can take all your measurements you can do all the cable sizing, uh, cable runs, all those sorts of bits and pieces. And then added onto that, we bought the software, uh, the, the certificate package, which is allows That's us sweet. to, yeah, which allows us to convert the design. So if we do a design, we can convert that directly onto a certificate. So it fills in all your wow. cable sizes, your, uh, your, your um, MCBs and RCDs and bits and pieces. Uh, and, and all those sorts of bits and pieces. And, and likewise, you can reverse engineer it. So you can, for an EICR, we take out a tablet, we fill it in as we go, we can take pictures, we can add pictures directly into the certificate. And then when we get back to the office, we can reverse engineer it, and that will put it into a schematic and tell us if our, if our cable calcs, or if the, the installed cables are the right cable for the installation type and the length of run and all those bits and pieces and it will flag up any warnings or, or issues and it's it's a phenomenal piece of software um it would be great to see apprentices trained with something like that but mm. i think a lot of it is more for the you know for for companies that are running the design side of life but, but certainly is, for the eicr certainly for the yeah. eicr stuff i think apprentices that'd be very great for them to know how to use things like that. That's a great shout. And you, you've taught me something there because I did not realise that they did a certificate pack in, in there. That's something that I'm going to have to have a chat with you off the podcast because I think that's something I need to look at myself into my own <laughs> business. And I know from chatting with um, Spencer actually earlier on last summer, he was going to do something for the apprentices um, in Apprentice One to One to do with that software package, um, we didn't have the the numbers of people in the group at the time that, that we do now. So I maybe need to revisit that with him and see if we can maybe get something set up. Um, as this all kind of exploded, I got lost in just trying to find people work. And uh, apologies, okay. Spencer, we do we do need to have a chat about that if you're still willing and yet you're listening to this. Uh, but yeah, definitely, that sounds like an absolutely incredible package. And um, speaking with Craig Gallagher on the last podcast, he leant towards the, the benefits of using software in your business to to make life easier. And um, you know that is another great example of a bit of software that can help us all with um, designing, installing, and certifying work. You know, it's, it's incredible to see the stuff that's out there. So I'm definitely going to be looking at that. You know, thanks for mentioning it, Stuart. That's all right. You know. Uh, you know, three, four years ago, we used to have the old scrappy bits of cardboard. You know, you'd, you'd do an install, you'd write it all down on the cardboard. Sometimes you'd lose it and then you'd have to go back and retest. <laughs> and, um, yeah, but now you can you can just fill it in in a tablet. Our tablet fits perfectly in the, in the mega case. So it's all there. We just pop it open and, yeah, and it's all stay, stored on the cloud. And, yeah, yeah, there's, yeah, there's no... It gives you total accountability on the job, doesn't it? So you're seeing the whole yeah. design stage certification, and then if a, if a client loses certificates or whatever, it's no big task to send them copies. Um, you know, the next contractor's coming in; they've got all of that information there for maintenance uh, in the in the future. It's just so helpful, and um, the fact you're offering that as, as a business has got to set you apart from some of the competition as well. So there's a benefit there from yourself, I guess, with marketing yourself towards certain um, clients you're trying to attract. Um, so it's it's a win win all round, really. I know you say there's an expense to it, but hopefully you get you get the return on that as time moves on and um, you you win bigger and better contracts. Well, that that's it. You know, we've we found it already that we did some work for um, for a, a, a business that we do. We now do quite a bit of work for, and the first job we did, we provided all the plans. At the end of the job, we did um, we gave them uh, as drawn plans. Uh, with all the test certificates all in one folder, and you know they they build some some very nice houses, and they look at it saying, "Well, we never we've never had any of this before," <laughs> and you know, and that's just thrown in at our standard price. You know, the, yeah. the, it's not an additional extra; it's not a 
costs, we just price up and go, this is how we work. This is what we're doing. And, and they can certainly see the benefit. Of course they can. I mean, that is great customer service and for you returning that client and, and getting a better relationship with them going forward where hopefully price isn't the driving factor in every service you're delivering. <laughs> you know, that, that's where you start to get the payback from stuff like that and, and a, a big roadblock to a lot of small businesses. And I speak as a contractor as a similar size to yourself, Stuart, is the expense of all this stuff. You're worried about spending resources on things that you don't think you're going to get a payback from. Uh, and often with most of this software, it, it does pay back and so um, I can certainly vouch for that. And I, I have Neil to a point to thank for it because he's kind of shoved me in the direction of software over the last year or so. And it's transformed the way we do things. John Lorimer as well, he's had input on it. And, and now yourself tonight, I'm going to be going off and um, looking at that package. So, you know, it is all out there. There's help for employers to kind of try and scale your business and use some of this software to help grow rather than, shrink your op- options and prospects yeah well to be honest Mark, i'm going to take a bit more credit for that because because i shoved nearly in that direction in the first place <laughs> well i knew there must be someone <laughs> sensible behind it uh, he can't have ever thought of that himself so i'm pleased you've <laughs> said that actually because he's been he's been waving that around in my face that he's kind of leading the software fight and now i know it's you i can tell him to shut up so th- thanks for that one <laughs> Uh, you know that that's another great a great point you've been a, a real star on this one um Stuart thanks very much for coming on to chat and just before we we leave it um you know that the, there's 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 people who think that, that the industry is kind of shattered to pieces and it, it's falling apart I, I'm not one of them I do think that generally we have a good trade to work in with um sound and solid prospects to the future but there there are problems and um obviously I've identified the apprenticeship as one and I'm trying to do my own little bit to help in any way I can with that. Um, what, what do you think? Do you think that the industry is um, set for a decent future or have you got a magic wand for some issues that you would like to wave and fix? How, how do you see it? Do you know what? I, I think the industry is is getting better. You know, we, we had issues with the Part P and we've got issues with short courses. But do you know what? I think with, with uh, the, the popularity of social media, it's it's helping the industry more than anything else obviously it, it highlights a lot of bad stuff but i remember when i started end of 2006 i had no one no one to help no one to turn to i just had to make my own mistakes and you know lose money here and there um and i sort of just i plodded along for about four or five years just just bumbling through the industry and you know now social media people come up to you they'll, they'll ask you questions um you know you put posts on people see the work you do and they go oh yeah could you uh could you just tell us how you do that or you know i, I just asked for a bit of advice and and things like that and and people aren't afraid to ask other people now mm. you know i think i think 10 15 years ago it was very much well uh, this this is my job this is how I do it and uh, I'm making the money. So I'm not going to share that with anybody. Yeah. Whereas, you know, now you can be in a supplier and, and like I said before, there's, I've been in the supplier and there's a couple of guys who will, who I know well, and they, they don't deal with solar or they don't deal with um, EV and they'll ask me questions and they say, Oh, what about this? And what about that? Or, and then they pass work your way. But then in return, you get a couple of small jobs come in that you think, well, it's a bit too small for me. And you send it their way and they're, you know, uh, and yeah. I think, I think working together, we make the industry better. That is a great point. I mean, I've done that with you. I've sent pictures of the odd inverter here and there asking you what the hell this is. <laughs> and, and like you say, in 2006, I wouldn't have had that resource. We were all still probably running around with library cards, trying to educate ourselves and, you know, winging it to a certain extent, like you say, learning as you go. Um, in a very small network of people and um, you know it wasn't that long ago really is it when we actually think about it Um, you know so how how things are now with social media and there's there's people everywhere who are are happy to help each other and um, there's no judgment for not knowing certain things certainly from the majority you'll always get the odd idiot who likes to kind of have bragging rights over everybody else but generally speaking it's a really positive experience on social media and um, I won't be talking to you tonight without it so you know it's it is a good thing, and apprentices have that resource in bucket loads. There's all the stuff plastered all over YouTube. 
So I don't know if you've seen um, Craig O'Neill's completely electrical channel that he's got. I mean, that's got some off yeah. the skill theoretical stuff on there. You've got all the GSH and Joe Robinson stuff, the Sparky Ninja um, and stuff on there. Adrian Davies popping stuff up on YouTube. There's people like yourself showing the work on Instagram and, and LinkedIn. Um, loads of other electrical contractors as well, such as Nick Bundy and Tom Nagy on YouTube. There's too many to mention. And um, especially now, while apprentices aren't in work, generally speaking, and they aren't in college, and they're all still trying to push on with the training to have that there. I mean, could you imagine in, in 2000, if this was me and you and we were stuck at home for a year trying to carry out our training, um, you know, it would be a, a lot more difficult, wouldn't it? So, you know, that is that is good that all of that resource is there and people have gone to the trouble to, to put it out. Yeah, and, it, and it's amazing that, you know, there's so much free stuff out there and people, like you say, they've gone to the trouble and it's completely free. Yeah. And, and a lot of people, you know, uh, slate them or you know like to make snidey comments or that sort of thing but at the end of the day they're doing it off their own back you know and, and like yourself with with apprentice to one-to-one it's it's off your own back you're not making any money from it and it's just to help the industry and and that's what it requires yeah i agree i agree that, that's that's nice of you to say and um, mention apprentice one-to-one as well thanks Stuart. where can people find you and um, K2 Electrical Services, where do they need to look for you if they want to dig into your brains and ask you some questions or maybe order some of your services? Well, as, as you say, um, we we joined the uh, the Instagram revolution, um, probably a little bit late to the party, but we, we joined that on the 1st of January this year. Um, and so we're under there as, as Kato, uh, Kato Electrical Services. Uh, and on LinkedIn as well under Cato Electrical. Lovely. I mean, so if anyone wants to to reach out to Stuart or go and follow him on Instagram and see some of the installs he's doing, I will pop a link to his Instagram page in the description for the YouTube video and on, on Podbean. And thanks again, Stuart, for taking the time to chat with me. I think a lot of people are going to find this both relevant and, and useful. Um, you know, so very kind of you to give up another evening to come and, and waffle away with me. And anytime you want to come back on and have another chat, just let me know if you've got a topic you want to cover around the apprenticeship system. It would be an absolute pleasure. So thank you very much. Not a problem, Mark. And, and thank you for having me on. Lovely. I'll uh, catch you on the next one. Brilliant. Cheers, mate. Stay.